Okay, good morning everybody. I think, I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, this is the intermediate class for REDCap. Um, we're going to, uh, it, first of all, just make sure everybody that is on the Zoom and in here has an active REDCap account. And if you don't, um, if you're on the Zoom call, please, please go ahead and um, shoot us a chat and we'll set you up with an account right away. Uh, let's see what we're doing today. So we're going over a lot of information today. There's no value for me in losing you somewhere. And again, like I said yesterday, I certainly don't want you frustrated with using REDCap. It should be something that you know is so friendly to you and you love to put your data in there and create projects. Um, and so, yes, there's a learning curve. Yes, this is an intermediate class, so it's not as basic as yesterday. But still, stop me if you don't understand something that I'm talking about. So I'm going to show you uh, version control, uh, how you can sort of uh, track changes that you make in the design of your project, um, and snapshots. They're really the same kind of thing. We're going to copy the project. So you know how to copy a project in case you want to uh, use it for something else or just play with it. And then we'll delete it so that you know how to delete a project. And I'll talk a little bit about the deletion process and, and what, what actually happens when you delete a project. We're going to create a couple new instruments. Um, one, so that we can use it downstream. Um, the other, because it's a different way of creating a uh, new instrument, and I want to make sure you know how to do this. So uh, I'll, I'll make sure that you understand how to do blank PDFs or uh, PDFs that have data in them um, in case you need it for a binder if you're a researcher uh, or you just need a hard copy for something. Um, I'll make sure that you know how to do that. Branching logic. Everybody wants to know branching logic. It's extremely uh, wonderful and, and powerful, but mostly it's just uh, so user friendly when somebody is entering data, uh, it will for as important as it is, it will probably take us about five minutes to do and learn. But um, now make sure that you understand how to use branching logic. Then we're going to get into surveys and the survey setup. Um, and I've told other people that I could easily do a four-hour class just on surveys and survey setup and. I still wouldn't be finished. There's just so much that surveys can do. And I don't want to completely overwhelm you with surveys, but I do want to set you up with as much knowledge about it as I can without completely boring you or losing you. Um, so I do want to make sure that you understand the basics about surveys and the components of it. So we'll take some time. We'll go over surveys. It will take a little time. Um, and again, if you have questions, stop me. And then we're going to get into longitudinal studies, which is also a sort of a big deal. A longitudinal study is one where you're collecting data over uh, points in time. So uh, if you had a five-year study and you were going to collect data at certain fixed points in time, like six months and a year and 18 months, something like that, that's a longitudinal study. And each one of those visits is an event. So we'll see how to set all that up. Um, then um, repeatable instruments. Now repeatable instruments are something totally different. They are not related to uh, longitudinal studies or events, and this is a this was a wonderful addition that came about last year, uh, late last year, um, which again allows you to collect data at random points in time rather than fixed points in time, which are events in a longitudinal study. I'll just briefly talk about arms of a study, how you can have arms of a study, how you set it up. Uh, roles, so if you have a project uh, that um, 
you're going to have, uh, my example is usually students. So let's say you were going to have rotating students come through and they were going to be there for six months or something and you have a five-year study again and they're, they're floating in and out. You don't want to have to go in every time you add a student and go through all those permissions. You want to set those permissions once, give it a role, and then just assign those people to the roles. Data access groups are the same thing as sites. So if you're doing a project and you're collecting data from different sites and you need to wall each site off from the other site as far as seeing the data that's been entered for those sites, that is a data access group, and I'll show you how to do that. Calculated fields will do a BMI so that you understand how calculated fields work. Uh, we'll just add a couple fields for um, weight and height, and then I'll show you how to set that up. The field comment history log is something that I remember when I started. I probably was doing it for months before I even knew the field comment history log was there, and it's right in front of my face. So I'll show you what that is and how that works. Um, then uh, I will try to get to explaining the difference between the development status and the production status um, and how that uh, affects how you're working with your project. And then I'll show you the file repository, uh, which is a place that you can hold documents that relate to the whole project, whereas we created a file upload field yesterday for specific records, the file repository would be something where you could put a protocol um, and the users could see uh, what's in the file repository. So I'll show you that. So let's go ahead and get into REDCap. All right. So I'm opening my project from yesterday. Um, if you weren't in, haven't done the beginning class or whatever and you have a project, that's fine, just open that up and we'll um, play around with that. So the first thing I want to do is show you how to create a snapshot um, of your project. Uh, so in case you make changes um, and then you decide that you don't like the changes, you can go back to the point in time. So I'm gonna go to my online designer And up at the top here, there's a button that says Create Snapshot of Instruments. If I just click on that button, you see a, like a, a little link that shows up underneath it. It says Last Snapshot. And if you click on the link, it takes you to the Project Revision History tab. So this tab shows you all the um, data dictionaries that have been created when you click on that uh, create a snapshot button. Now, you don't need to know what a data dictionary is at this point. Just make sure that you click on create a snapshot when you're making changes. Now the data dictionary and the create a snapshot is capturing the architecture of your project. No data, okay, but all the fields, the instruments, the branching logic, alignment, um, the options, all of that is the architecture of your project, and it's all captured in that snapshot. And so if you go off and make some changes and get down a path and say, I, I don't like where I've ended up, I've made some changes and lost something that I wanted. There's no worries. You can send us an email at redcap at email.arizona.edu, and I'll be happy to put your project back online or even restore it to a new project so that you have both, whichever you need. But I can't do it if you don't have the data dictionary. So it's a good ha habit to get into 
to just click on that button when you're going to start making a bunch of changes in that way. If you need to go back to that point in time, you can. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> The point was, should you make it prior to making your, or click on the button prior to the changes, and yes, that is, that's key. <laughs> You're welcome. Good question. Um, so now we want to copy a project. So I'm going to go back to my, yes. You can create multiples and go back to any point in time that you have created the snapshot. Yes, the point was can we create, once you create a snapshot, you can go back to a point in time from whenever you created that snapshot, and that is correct. As long as I have a data dictionary from any of those points in time, I can recreate a whole new project architecturally. And I, I just want to be clear the difference between the architecture and the data. So there is no data in this. If you need to do snapshots of data, I, I'm not quite sure why you would do that. We do have backups, and I can explain that um, as we get further into this. But uh, this just addresses the architecture. And yes, any point in time that you want to use your data dictionary, we can put it back online for you. No, no, it's, it's, it's truly version control. Nothing gets erased every time you do that. So you're safe and you're not overwriting anything and you could go back three, four snapshots if you wanted and then restore a project from that. Okay, so I'm going to go to, uh, back to my project setup only because the other functionality tab is always next to the project setup tab. So I'll go to my other functionality tab, and I want to copy my project. So there's multiple reasons you might want to copy a project. Uh, you may um, be completing a project and getting ready to start a new one that is virtually identical, and you don't want to have to recreate all your instruments, so you can just copy it. Um, and when you do, you click on the button, and the first thing you need to do is rename the project to something else. Uh, and that's all you need to do. You do want to look um, through all of these options here. So you want to know whether you want to carry your records forward or not. If it's going to be a new project, then you wouldn't, but if you are planning on using the copy and maybe making some changes uh, sort of experimentally and find that you want to keep that and delete your original, then maybe you want to keep your records with you. Same with users and user roles. All these are options for you in your copy. So I'm just going to um, take mine and make a blank copy, click on copy project, and now if you see uh, I've got my copy project. Here, if I look at my record status dashboard, which shows me all my records, you'll see there's none. But if I look at my designer, you'll see that my instruments are all here. So I've got a perfect copy of my project. So now I've played around and played around, and now I'm ready to delete this for housekeeping sake. So I'm going to go back to my Project Setup tab so that I can see my Other Functionality tab, which is right next to it. I'll click on the Other Functionality tab and scroll down a little further, and you will see Delete the Project. I'm going to click on that. You get multiple opportunities to delete it and make the decision that you're deleting it. And once you've decided and you close, you will find yourself back at your projects. And the project is deleted. Now I'm going to go back and reopen uh, my original one. Now, I just want to talk just a little bit about deleting a project. So if you are... Um, you have a copy, you're making some changes to it, um, just to test. 
and then you're going to put them in your original project and uh, you do so and then you delete your copy and you're working along in your original project and something just seems wrong. You can't put your finger on it at first and finally you look up at the title and you see that you actually deleted your original by mistake and not your copy. And this has happened. Um, it's not entirely uncommon. So you're emailing in a panic and saying, I accidentally deleted my project. Is there any way to restore it? And the answer is yes. So when you delete a study, uh, it actually creates like a pointer. And the pointer is used to hide it from you in your My Projects. However, the project isn't actually deleted for about 30 days. And I can see your project, and I can see it's slated for deletion. But if you want it recovered, I can recover it for you. All I have to do is click a button, and it's back in your projects, and you can see it again. So if you ever delete something by mistake, don't panic, and um, I, a project, and I can uh, retrieve it for you. Uh, also, since we're talking about um, deletion, uh, I'd like to just try and uh, introduce the concept of deleting fields in on an instrument that have data or changing the variable name of a field that has data. So you've started to collect some data. This is not in the design phase. We've now moved forward a little bit. We've, we've got a little bit of live data in there. And um, you're thinking, I don't like the variable name for that. I, I'm going to change some of my variable names. And you go back to your record status dashboard, and you just scream because all of a sudden part of your data is gone. And you're thinking, oh my gosh, I made these changes to my variable names, and I lost my data because I changed the variable name. And, and the answer is you didn't actually delete anything. Deletion is an action of actually removing data that you see. You know you uh, go to a record and you blank out data in a certain field. That's going to delete data. But if you haven't done that, what you've done is dissociate the variable name with the data. So in the back end of the database, all the data is associated to those variable names that you created. Once you add a piece of data, it's stuck on the variable name. And there is a division, I, I think. So the, the web piece that you're looking at there is uh, really on one server, and all of your data is on another server. And the data is tied together by the variable name. And if you change the variable name on the architecture of your project in the web, you're no longer talking accurately to the database where the data is being held with that variable name. So be careful about changing variable names. It's fine to do when you're in the testing phase and you don't need to, you don't really care about data. Um, when you uh, start collecting live data, you may very well want to just erase all the data for the project, um, and that's fine. If you change a variable name and the data disappears, all you need to do is recreate the variable name in your project, and all your data will reappear. So just kind of get the idea that the variable name and the data are what are tied together. And data does not 
generally just get deleted. In fact, I don't know of any situation where we've ever just lost data without a, a reason, and I've never found data disappear from a project that I couldn't find. So um, I want you to feel confident about entering data into your project, and we will at some point, um, uh, if you do attend or you know, view the advanced class or you want to uh, look into logging, uh, that's a feature that will help ensure that you know what data was actually entered into your project, but that's in, in an advanced class. But So the data is not going to get deleted, and uh, unless you actually uh, wipe it out. So uh, let's um, look at PDFs real quick. So there's multiple ways of uh, printing or seeing a PDF of uh, your instruments or instruments with data. Um, the first way is in your designer mode. Over here, there is an area that says blank PDF. And all you need to do is click on that. And in this case, it's downloading it to the desktop. And here's the blank PDF. So you can use this, print it off, store it in a binder, do whatever you need to do if uh, that's something that you want to do. Um, Shoot. Oh, there it is. OK, um, so that's one way. Uh, the other way, which I think is, is pretty comprehensive, if you um, go to your record status dashboard and you open one of your instruments, there is an option here to download PDFs of the various instruments, and you can uh, print a uh, blank of that data entry form or with the data in there, or you can print all the data entry forms as blanks or all the data entry forms with the data that is in this. This is the most comprehensive place to print PDFs just within a, a single instrument, if you open it up, you'll see all these options. So I went, how I got here was, you got it? So yeah, record status dashboard to any of these instruments, and it will give you the button up at the top where you can print all that. The final place that you can do this is an, in the, uh, record home page and you get that either by clicking over here on the left where you see the subject number or if you're in the record status dashboard you just click on the uh, initial number and it takes you here and there are actions here some of which are downloading PDFs for all instruments um, and so so that is an option or you can have a uh, there's a lot you can do in this record home page. Again, this is where you would delete a record. All right. Um, I want to uh, go to my designer now. And I'm going to create a new instrument. Uh, this is one that we will use later in our um, class. So I'm just going to click on that Create a New Instrument button in the Online Designer. And I'm going to put it right below the consent form. And I'm going to call this EKG form and create it. All right, so I'm going to add a few fields here, um, again, for use a little later on in the class. Uh, I'm going to add, uh, first of all, a field um, that is a text box. 
and I'll just put EKG date for a label and whatever you want to use for a variable name. And then for validation, I certainly want to make sure that I capture my date in the same format that I've used previously if you used month, day, year. So stick with that and I'll save that. And now I've got a place to capture my EKG. Um, then I want to add a field below that and I want to make this a file upload for users to upload files, file upload. And I'll just say uh, EKG tracing. And some variable name. And that's all I need for this. So now I have a place to put a, 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 a graphic image of that EKG. And then below that, I'm just going to add a notes field for uh, and call this um, interpretation. And something for a variable name. And uh, like all my comments or notes type boxes, I'm going to go ahead and change right away, make this alignment left, justified, vertical or horizontal, you'll get the same thing. So now I have all this room for somebody to type in an interpretation. Okay, so that, that's all I want for this for the moment. And I'm going to return to my list of instruments. So now I've got three instruments. So now I want to add one, but this time, I want to add something that is common. It's something that you see frequently uh, in, uh, you know, maybe NIH type studies, um, forms that are uh, have been vetted by other institutions, and you might want to use one of those. Uh, and not have to uh, create a new instrument from scratch. So Vanderbilt keeps a library of all these kinds of uh, forms. And we're going to look in their REDCap shared library here in the middle and click on the import button. And if we click on the import button, then it's going to take us to the uh, Vanderbilt um, shared library. Okay, so just glancing down here, you can kind of see that there are, um, by all these pages, there's hundreds and hundreds of these um, pre built instruments, um, and you're welcome to use these. Uh, you just need to sort of poke around and see if you can find what you want. So one of the big ones that people use are promise forms. So if I type in promise and search the library, you're going to see that there are all kinds of promise forms listed. And when you do this, you'll see that these are actually in different languages. So if you needed a promise form in a or any of these in a different language, you might check here first and see if it's already been done. Um, I'm going to search for uh, a certain type of promise form only because it will make it easy for me. Uh, and I'm looking for uh, promise parent proxy SF. And again, it doesn't matter what you choose. It just makes it easy for me to show you uh, how this works. So I've, I've clicked, I've narrowed down to this, and I'm going to go to the second page. Notice there's lots of these parent proxy forms. And I want the pain behavior one. Now, if you'll notice, there's, you'll see auto scoring, and you'll see adaptive sometimes. Uh, auto scoring, I'm sure you can kind of figure out. The auto scoring um, will uh, assign a value to each of the responses and then total it at the bottom. Uh, 
Adaptive means that questions will hide or show based on responses. Uh, adaptive instruments are not instruments that you would uh, be able to change um, usually. Uh, but the difference with um, the the ones that aren't auto scoring or adaptive, you can make any changes as you want. If you wanted to score them differently, you could grab this instrument and then make changes to it. So if I click on it, it gives me the opportunity to view it as a web page, which is usually my first choice. And I just get a glance and I see, oh, yeah, this is exactly what I wanted. I've seen this before. This is exactly the form that I want to use for my project. So when I close that, then all I need to do is um, Im import into my REDCap project. And you click on that, and there's a lot of text here that deals with the content agreement. You do have to scroll all the way to the bottom and then check the box that says, I agree with the terms, and then the I agree button. And it will take you to this window here that says it is going to import from the shared library. It has not imported it yet. Okay, so you need to click the Add button. And when you do, it tells you the instrument was successfully imported. You return to the previous page, and there is your promise form or whatever form you needed downloaded to your project. So very easy way uh, for you to grab a form that may have already been created. So check out the library when you're using standardized type instruments. OK. Let's look at branching logic here. So I'm going to go to my screening form. We've already sort of set this up. And again, if you're using some other instrument, um, some other project, that's fine. Uh, we, are, we have a uh, field for race. And we have an option on race, a checkbox for other. And we also have a place to hold the value of that other race. We don't really want to show other race unless someone has checked the box for other. So there is, you, when you apply branching logic, you always apply it to the field that you're hiding and showing, not to the parent. And if you mouse over little green two-sided arrows, you'll see this is branching logic. So if I click on that two-sided arrow, it takes me to a screen here for branching logic. Now, I, I, I plan on petitioning Vanderbilt to please change this. It used to be different. I don't know why they really changed it, but um, it starts out with a button, radio button, and sets you up for this advanced branching logic. I never use that. I don't know why any of us would start there. So I'm telling you, the first thing to do is click on that little radio button that says drag and drop logic builder so that you don't have to try and figure all this out programmatically. When you do that, a list of every single option for that particular instrument that is being displayed up here becomes visible. Everyone. So if you wanted to set up branching logic that referred to a field on a different instrument. So for example, if you only wanted uh, a field on your third form to show uh, if the gender was female, you could do that. You would open up that field that you want to hide and show, and then you would refer back to the screening form. You would pick up gender, 
and then you would use that to hide or show a variable. So it doesn't matter what form you pull from. So in this case, um, I want to find race other, and it's very easy to find here, race other, and I'm just going to left click, drag, and drop it right over to this window. Now, notice that there are two types here. There is the ability to say any of these are true, which is an or statement in logic, or all are true, which is an and statement in logic. So if you said race other and um, gender female, and then both of those would have to be true to show this field. Well, we don't want that, so I'm going to get rid of the gender. And so I'm just going to save it like this. And then I'm going to, uh, first of all, see that you can see on the field that there is branching logic and what the logic is for that particular field. So if I go up to my record status dashboard and I uh, just grab one of my screening forms and I scroll down, I can see that there is no longer other race. And if I click on any of these other fields, nothing shows up until I check other and then other race shows up. So that's branching logic ability to hide and show. So there are so many different ways you can use this. Um, I use it extensively in virtually every project that I uh, work with. So an example would be if you had a, a phone screening um, script and you were asking questions uh, to the person on the phone and you like ask 10 questions and at the end of the 10 questions they either meet inclusion criteria or they do not meet inclusion criteria. If they do, immediately <clears throat> 10 more questions pop up and the person doing the interview just keeps on <clears throat> moving forward with the questions. If they don't meet inclusion criteria, another box pops up that is just a dialog box that says, you know, thank you for participating in, this, in, in our phone interview. You don't qualify for our, prod, uh, our study at the moment. Can we keep your name on file or whatever, you know, you want to say. But you can completely design what you see and what you don't see to assure that you have accurate data entry by using branching logic. Surveys. Remember, if you start to get lost somewhere, please give me a shout out. So what we want to do to start is we're going to go to our project setup tab. I'm going to get to it up here on the left where there's a link that says project setup. And I'll go there and um, at some point, I think I, I may have said in the beginning class, um, the only difference between a survey and a regular instrument is the click of a button. And that's all there is. You're, you change or enable a form to act as a survey. So to start that process, you need to enable survey use on your project. So notice that there are two um, links over here under data collection. And if I look at my designer, my online designer, I'll see that I have four columns. Now if I go to my project setup and I click on the very first button under main project settings, and I enable the use of surveys in this project, now I have three links over here on the left, one of which is survey distribution tools. That lets you know that you've enabled this. And if I go to my online designer, you'll see that there are now six columns, um, along with buttons for enable something as a survey. So 
When you want to enable something in a survey, all you will need to do is click this button to start and to finish if that's what you want. But let's go ahead and turn our screening form into a survey and walk through this process. Okay, so I'm going to click on this screening form and enable it. What I've done um, is I have three surveys already open to show you some of the differences of the nuances in how this um, gets displayed. So the first field here is the survey title. This is based on the instrument that you just enabled. You have no um, requirement to leave the survey title as the name of the instrument. You can change it to anything you want. So over in this survey, uh, this was actually the very first survey I ever did. Um, this is the title oh, right there. Over here, uh, this is the title. And over here, there is no title. So there is no requirement that you have a title. All of these are surveys. Yes? Uh-huh. OK. So, no, I'm glad you asked. So I'm going to just step back again, make sure that I bring everybody up to speed on this. So I'm going to go back to uh, the designer first. Do you see the enable buttons? Yes, enable the survey. Got it? All right. So um, I'll leave screening form on there. Below that, survey instructions. I think this is fairly uh, self-explanatory. Bless you. You can say anything that you want here. Uh, notice you have nice little word processing tools to make it look as nice as you want. Um, these are relatively new. Um, they were not available when I did these, but you could still um, make it work. These are my instructions here. Uh, over here, these are the instructions. And over here, there are no instructions. Then the design options, a logo. Well, I kind of recommend the logo. People have really done a great job with um, embracing the logo. It makes your survey look a little bit more professional. For the La Posada, all I did was go to the College of Nursing and uh, right-click on their uh, logo on their web page and then paste it in here. Uh, for, the, for this one, I just did something in Photoshop to you know, make something that looked I was playing. Um, but we did use this for a while. And then uh, this one. Um, this is the logo from our department, Center for Biomedical Informatics and Biostatistics. So all those are just logos from the site, and you can see how they look. After that, you have the option of using enhanced radio buttons. So this is somewhat embarrassing. Uh, first, let me show you what this is. There's an option here to see what enhanced radio buttons look like and, or, and check boxes. Uh, so, yeah, I would demonstrate that, and I'd say, so, you know, this was great for the visually impaired, and, uh, you know, or, or if you know, were having trouble with, you know, clicking on a button, you can make it bigger, so, you know. And then, you know, this is, you know, standard. This is just using the regular out-of-the-box, no changes, no enhanced buttons. Then I hired somebody that, actually had design skills, of which I have none. Uh, and I start seeing something like this, and I'm like, holy cow, this looks great. So although you can't do this just with enhanced radio buttons, it does require a little bit of scripting behind the scenes, you can see how much better this can look, depending on the right, if it's the right project, then um, this is a great option to use these enhanced radio buttons. And if you want to go that route and you want help with making it you know, more dynamic like anything you see today, please just redcap at email.arizona.edu and we'll be happy to help you give you code and whatever. I'm going to show you some uh, 
we actually have things that you can use um, and copy and paste if you need to um, do some things that are involve programming. So that's that's the check boxes underneath that, the size of the survey text. You can change the, your survey text to normal, large, or very large. It, by default, it is large. However, I do want to point out, just so you know, at the top of every project, unless you purposely get rid of it, uh, is the option for the user to resize the font themselves. So if they can't see it, they can resize it themselves, and you don't have to worry so much about what size it is when you create it. Uh, the font of the survey text is pretty self-explanatory. If you look at the drop-down, there are these fonts that are available to you, but only these fonts. Uh, you can't put in your own font. Uh, survey theme. Okay, so this is where you can let that inner creative person out. Um, there are some pre-packaged themes for your project. Uh, they are, you can see them down below in this window. So if you want to call up uh, some of these other ones, you can kind of see that they all look kind of different. And if you see one you like, then you can pick it. Or you can customize that once you see something you like. If you click on the Customize button, there are all these options for making changes here or there. And um, you can make this look any way you want. And then when you're done, you save your changes. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and exit out of this and just go back to my default. Uh, this is an example of default here. I mean, very basic. Um, this is the red brick that I was playing with when I made this. And this is actually the default also. Um, nothing fancy. Uh, all the changes here are getting made using some little HTML tweaks, which we haven't talked about. But um, question numbering. Uh, you can have your questions auto-numbered or not. Again, it's fairly self-explanatory. The question display format. Uh, so this is where you, if you have a, a long page of uh, questions, um, and you want to break it up into different pages so it's not so onerous to keep scrolling down and down and down. Um, you can choose to have uh, your survey broken up with one section per page, and this is managed by the, the uh, headers that we did yesterday. So, for example, in this La Posada, I just took what was a long survey and just put in headers in as best I could in a way that would break up the pages. So this one looks pretty easy, and then the next page is a little longer. And then, but you get this nice next, next page and previous page thing so people can scroll through these and, and look. So um, they go back and forth. And up here is a uh, page number of so many. So this is, a, a, but each one of these is broken up by these headers. Allow participants to download a PDF uh, at the end of the survey. Again, fairly self-explanatory. When they finish the survey, then they have the option of, of getting uh, a complete PDF of all the questions and their responses so that they know what they said, um, if they would like that. Survey-specific email invitation field. This is something that um, it, it, we would deal with in more advanced class. You don't need to worry about that for this class. Uh, for required fields, I don't know why I go over this. For, for required fields, display the red must provide value text. I, I know there must be a reason for this. If you say no, then if you remember when we did a required field, you got this little red must provide value, which I felt was pretty helpful to know that this was a required field. But you could hide it and say and not show it, and I guess that when somebody fills out the form and doesn't fill in one of those required fields, they'll get a box pop up and say, you know, you've 
failed to enter data into this field and it's required and I'm like, you know, is that, are you trying to surprise the people that fill out your surveys or what? So I don't know why you use this, but it is there if you don't want to uh, show that. Allow survey respondents to view aggregate survey results. All right, so you've all, I'm sure, seen something like this. Uh, you log into um, ESPN or MSN or Fox or CNN, and they ask you some question like, what's your favorite color? And there's red, green, and blue for an option, and you select one, and it takes you to like a graph and it shows you how many percent selected what option. That's what this is, and allows you to show the respondents uh, as a percentage or whatever, how they their selection compared to everybody else. It, there is a requ uh, an expectation if you enable it, um, is we're gonna do the graph. There's so many that you need respond before you show that. So um, it's kind of maybe not as valuable if there's only one response. Text-to-speech functionality. All right, this is going to be interesting. I hope this works in here, um, and I hope it works on the call or for the people that are Zoomed. We'll see here. So if you use text-to-speech functionality, what you get is these little speakers in front of all the fields. And if you click on one. First name. Oh, good. It works. Last name. And so it just reads you to whatever is the there. Training, please complete the form below. That is text to speech. So if you want that, yes. That's a good question. The question is, can you invent? Can you like put? Uh, a video with sign language on it to explain um, the what the, you want from them in the survey, and the answer is yes. And uh, I think that I do that in the advanced class, but I'll show you. Uh, I can show you after class how to do that. Um, underneath that, we have the response limit. So if you only want 150 or 200 people to respond. You can put a number here, and then at the end of that, there's a message they receive uh, that the survey is closed. You need to decide if you want partial and completed responses or just completed responses only to meet your limit of 150 or 200 or whatever you put in here. Time limit for survey completion. Okay, so this is maybe not what it seems, this isn't a timed survey. This doesn't mean that once you open it, you have 10 minutes to finish it. This means that from the time that you've received it, uh, how long you have to uh, complete it before it kind of um, becomes inactive. So it's, it's just a period of time from when uh, it, it's gone out to them, and then if they haven't filled it out in like 20 days or 30 days, then you know you don't care about their response. Survey expiration. So, like, if you only want to collect responses for two months, you put in a date in here, and uh, at the end of that period, the survey will expire. Save and return later. This is an option so that if uh, you have an especially long survey and somebody uh, is on question 35 of 80 and all of a sudden the doorbell rings and the dog starts barking and the kids start crying and you smell something on the stove and you're instead of just saying forget this survey I'm not I'm just gonna blow it off there is an option there to click on a button that says save and return later so if they save and return later they will put in their email address, and then they will get an email with a link and a password, just like we talked about send it. 
same kind of thing. They will click on the link, they will put in their password, and it will take them right back to where they left off. So, a um, couple things about that. First of all, uh, the, the possible downside of that is you are opening yourself up for the potential for um, incomplete responses. So if they never come back, then you get a partial response. Yes? The question is, can you send out reminders to ask them to finish the completion? And the answer is yes, I will show you that. Thanks for asking. Um, so uh, that's the thing with the save and return later. Um, and I mentioned the fact that they're putting in an email address. Uh, before I go any further, I do want to comment about the difference between anonymous surveys and surveys that are identifiable. So if you want to be able to get back to somebody, then you need to put something on your survey for you to be able to contact them. I have had projects where I've gotten an email and say, so I've got about 10 responses now, and I want to start sending them a follow-up survey. How do I do that? I said, well, where's the email address for the person? Well, I didn't ask them that. Well, how are you going to send them anything? You don't know who they are. So, but there is advantages, of course, to anonymous, because, for example, you're going to receive at some point a uh, survey from us that says, what did you think of the class? And if you fill it out, there is no way for me to know who responded because we don't ask that question. So there's no behind the scenes thing that I can use. You can't come to me and say, I didn't put this on, so can you help me find this person? I can't. Um, you need to make sure that you put an email address on there if you want to contact them. Now, with the save and return later, I mentioned that the person puts in their email address and they get this email sent to them with the link. Does that mean you can use that email address uh, in an emergency? No, you can't. That email address is just a quick generated Thing to allow the email to go out, but there's no way for us to know um, that's not captured on your form somewhere. So just keep in mind, if you need to get back to somebody, make sure you put a field on there so you know how to get back to them. Optional auto continue to next survey. A lot of people use this. I'm going to check this box so you see how it looks. I, I think that uh, some people use this, I really should ask them, but I think some people use this for, um, in place of uh, the long survey that's being broken up by headers. Uh, it allows you to create like 10 instruments, and then when one instrument is completed, it automatically loads the next one. Uh, an example is we have a uh, project that has parents and children in it. And it's asking questions, and uh, you'll hit a point when you're identified as a child, and it will take you to a, another survey, and then walk you through that survey, and a second survey, and a third survey, because they're set up to auto-continue. If you're a parent, it takes you to a different set of three and walks you through those and automatically keeps loading it one after the other after the other. Um, so uh, I'll show you how that looks once we save it. Redirect to a URL if you will like when they're finished because these are termination options. When they're finished with the survey, do you want them to immediately go back to your homepage? 
put it in there, survey completion text, whatever you want them to say, use the word processing tools. E-consent for format is outside the, um, this course. And send confirmation email just so you know this is a confirmation email that goes back to the person filling it in, not you. If you want to be notified, it's a totally different way. So I'm going to save those changes now after all that. And now you can see that this is a survey. There's a little green shield with a checkbox. And if you notice right next to it, there is a down arrow. This means that it's automatically continuing to the next survey. If there is one, if there's not one, it's going to stop right there. So if I want to change my survey settings, there is a button right there. Once I've created it, I can go to the survey settings. I can scroll down here. I can uncheck the box and save it. And now I've, you notice that the arrow is gone. So that is survey settings. So I now have this set up as a survey. I want to post this on my website. I want to have a link or I want to send it out. I have a distribution list. I want to send this survey out to a bunch of people, have them fill it out, and send it back. To do that, I'm going to use the survey distribution tools. If I click on the survey distribution tools, it takes me right here, and I see that I can open a public survey. If I open the public survey, here is my nice little screening form, and it's now a survey. And people fill it out, and they submit it, and it automatically will create a new record and uh, save all your data. So um, uh, fill this out real quick so we can see uh, I'll submit this. All right, so I've submitted this. I'll close my survey. Let's look at my record status dashboard. So you can see here's my one, uh, person that I just added, and I can tell that this was added via a survey because it is a green circlet with a white checkbox in it. And if I look at my legend up above, it shows me that that is a completed survey response versus just a completed response, which was not a survey. If I open it, there's some nice information here. It tells you when the survey was completed. So you know, you know when somebody uh, entered this information and, and, and submitted it. Um, also, along with this, this didn't used to be possible, but uh, again, about a year or two ago, Vanderbilt made the change to allow you to edit a survey. Originally, the thinking was once a survey is entered, no one should be able to make a change because it, you know the data was collected from the survey, only that person should be able to enter the data. However, then they realized that there is a value in being able to edit responses. So if you need to edit your survey, and then you click on the edit responses. However, I'm going to jump over to user rights just quickly to make sure that you see that once you create or enable a, an instrument as a survey, if we look at the permissions, notice that there's something new over here. It's edit survey responses. So this is a permission. You can give or remove that. By default, when you add somebody, it um, will automatically give them permission to edit it. So you will want to go in. If you create a new uh, user, you'll want to uncheck it if you don't want them to be able to edit those responses. If you create the um, survey after you've had a user, by default, these are not checked. So it doesn't just go in automatically and check them. So if you want her to be able to edit um, then you click on the box and save the change, and now she can make those edits. So, 
I'm as you I'm sorry, I missed yep. when what you clicked on to get into the survey to fill it out. Uh, to get into the survey, what? I'm sorry. When you filled out to the what? responses, I I'm, I looked away from my screen and you were suddenly. Oh <laughs> oh 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 no problem. So um. I got there by going to the survey distribution tools. The question was how to um, put the data into the survey. Is that correct? Am I right? Yes, that was correct. Okay. All right. So I went to the survey distribution tools, and then I just opened this public survey. Okay, when I got here, then I could fill it out and then submit it. That's all I did. Okay? Great. Thank you. Um, now that I'm back here, uh, there, um, if you want to send your survey out uh, in a distribution list, here's the link um, right here. Whoop, there we go. Uh, you can send it out with um, email. You can have a QR code. Uh, Someone was asking me that yesterday about QR codes. And you can create um, a QR code for your survey. Um, you can create your own custom link. So there's a lot of things you can add reCAPTCHA. Uh, I don't know if you are familiar with reCAPTCHA. Um, if you add it and then open it, then you know it wants you to make sure that you're not a robot, and then it takes you through this thing. I would. I'm not all that thrilled about. Uh, so that's how that works. Uh, now, let's go back to the record status dashboard and notice that when I entered Abraham Lincoln, uh, the subject number was automatically created because each time somebody enters a survey, they're automatically generated. There's no need to worry about 10 or 12 people entering surveys at the same time. There's no chance of losing surveys and survey IDs are handled out, handed out electronically. So you don't need to worry about um, multiple people entering, excuse me, data into your project at once. Uh, so I'm going to go back to my uh, designer. I'm going to get it up here in the top left. Now I want to make my consent form uh, a survey. So I'm going to enable that. And I'm not going to go through all this. I'm just going to save the changes. So it's now a survey. So now I want to send the consent form out. I'm going to go back up to my survey distribution tools, and I'm going to open it, and that's not right. I want the consent form. So how do I get to the consent form? Uh, you can't. So just so you know, the consent form cannot be something that you put out for the public. Why is that? If I look at my designer, if you remember, I said that the record ID is generated using the first instrument. So only the first instrument can be posted on a website for random people to enter data into. Now, that does not mean that the consent form can't be um, used as a survey, and, and I'll show you how to do that. It's just that I don't want people frustrated trying to find out how to post their consent form on the website, because you can't. I had somebody who had a project and had four instruments, all of which were surveys. Um, Each one was unique in how it collected data. And each one 
needed to be posted on a website. So one was like for a self-referral for this study. Another was to refer someone else to the study and they wanted to be able to track how these were coming in because they had different links and different parts of the website. The only way you can do that is to actually have four different projects. Each one would have to have um, the, the instrument in it and then you go through the process that we just did for the survey distribution tool and you could then post that link and the data would dump into four different projects. So that's how that works. Now, if you want to send out the consent form, I'm going to go to the survey distribution tools. And, and there's a few ways of doing this, so I'm going to kind of walk through a couple uh, different ways. So if if you look, we did see the public survey link, um, and notice here, uh, I'll quickly go back to the designer, and I'm going to turn off the, um, I'm sorry, I'm going to come back here and turn this off as a survey. And so notice that the consent form is my first survey. If I go to the survey distribution tools, there is no longer a public survey link, right? Because it has to be the first instrument. So if I come back to my designer, enable this again, and save all these changes, then come back to my survey distribution tool. Now I do have a, a public survey link. Okay, so just remember that. So now I look at the participant list tab. I see three emails here, which ironically, I have three records in my dashboard. I come here, I got three entries. So there's probably a relation there. So how can I use this so that I can, oh, this participant list, how can I get this like turned on? So if you want to use email addresses downstream to send out surveys, whether it's automatically, manually, whatever, your project needs to know what email field to use to reference that email. So if I go back to my uh, project setup, okay, the setup, not the designer, the setup, there underneath this enable optional modules and customizations, there is a button here that says designate an email field for sending survey invitations. That's exactly what we want. If I enable it, I can select the field up above. If I click on it, there's nothing there, which is very unhelpful. I want you, and I'm, I'm showing you this in this way for a reason. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to cancel out of that. Why is there no email address? I know I have an email address in my online designer in my instrument. So if I go to my online designer, because I'm going to prove it to myself, I'm going to look at my screening form, and I'm going to scroll down and say, look, there's my email field. I'm going to look at the design, and I'm going to say, oh, I didn't identify it as an email field. This is why in the beginner's class I tell you, don't identify it as an email so that you can understand if you don't see it when you go to enable it why you wouldn't see it. The only reason you won't see an email field show up in that uh, link between the, pro the surveys and your project is that the email field is not validated as an email field. So if I save this and then I come back to my Project Setup tab. 
and then I go down again to enable my email field for sending survey invitations. And I come up here. Now I have an email address. It, it's in my screening form. I could have 10 different email fields and on different forms, and you would want to pick the one that you're going to use going forward for sending out um, emails to this particular participant. So I'm going to save that. And now it says below, field currently designated for email is email. Now I've linked that. So I'm going to go back to my survey distribution tools. I'm going to look at my participant list. And I still don't have anything there. So why would that be? So I'm going to go back to my, uh, exactly. So I'll go back to my record status dashboard. I'm going to go to uh, the first um, option. And lo and behold, there's no email address here. So if I enter one, and save this, and then go back to my survey distribution tools and take a look at my participant list, all of a sudden, there it is. So the only reason you won't see emails here, once you've associated the email field correctly to your surveys, is because there's no email in that particular record. You can see what record I entered here. So if I go back to my record status dashboard, hop down here to my next record, enter and then grab my third record and put an email here. Now look at my survey distribution tools again, go to my participant list, and now everybody is showing up. So from here, you can select any of your surveys. I'll select my consent form. And then I can compose a survey invitation. I can click on that, and I can figure out who or when I want to send this survey out to. So if I want to send a survey to everybody at a certain time, then I can fill this out and it's automatically you know, filled out here. Um, notice that uh, there is a um, from address. And if you click on this, the from address is anybody that is in your project. Uh, but if you notice, I seem to have multiple options for uh, my email address. Why do I have three and Colleen only has one? So let me hop outside this particular project uh, so you can, and you can watch, you don't have to actually do this, but if I go to uh, like my projects, up at the top right, there's something that says my profile. If I click on my profile, here's everything that is important as far as you're logging into REDCap. You can change your password if you want or, you know, do whatever. But there are two fields, secondary email and tertiary email. This allows you to uh, have a departmental email address assigned, uh, associated to your account. So if you want to be able to use that uh, for from uh, emails, then go ahead and put some uh, other email address along with your profile, and then you'll be able to use it when you go into designing your uh, survey invitations. So again, you can uncheck 
everybody, just select whoever, and then send out an invitation. Another way to send something is by, uh, if we go to our um, online designer, okay, there's something called the automated invitation. So let's say you want your consent forms sent out five days after you receive a screening form. So I'll come over to my automated survey invitation, and now you can see that there is a whole setup here uh, about this particular survey, and um, this is going to go to all participants who meet the conditions that you define. So I'm going to say I want this to go out as soon as the screening form is finished, but uh, how about five days later? Okay, and then you can resend it as a reminder if they have not responded in a specified time. That answers the question earlier, right? Okay. So, and then you can activate the, these rules or not. And let, and then, for example, let's say you only wanted uh, this consent form to be sent out if they were female. So you could select this and say. Uh, gender equals two, something along those lines. And you see an example of that down here below. So if you forget how to do that. But this allows you to customize how this particular survey is sent out and it would be sent out automatically. Uh, if you want to be notified when a survey is uh, comes in, the easiest way is there is a button here called survey notifications. Click on the survey notifications, pick which instrument you want to be notified about, and uh, just plug your email address in and automatically when a survey comes in, it will go to that email address and notify you that a survey has been uh, completed. Okay, so that surveys, um, I know that uh, there could be other questions about this, but I need to move on. Uh, as I said, surveys could, we could easily go for four hours. There's so many um, great features in here that you can use, but hopefully this gives you a, a basics to start um, in making your surveys. And then if you have questions, redcap at email.arizona.edu. All right, let's talk about longitudinal studies. I'm going to go back to my project setup. I'm going to turn off the surveys for now, just so that I'm not confused in the process. And right below my surveys is use longitudinal data collection. So I'm going to enable that feature. And uh, as soon as I do, down below here, two new buttons popped up that weren't there before uh, to allow you to define your events and designate instruments for them. So remember, a longitudinal study is one where you're grabbing data at fixed periods of time, which are called events. So I'm going to click on the Define My Events button. And down below here, I can set up my events. So event one, that doesn't tell me anything, so I want to change that. It's just a placeholder. So I'm going to click on the little pencil, and I'll change this to screening. And then I'll save that. And then I'm going to add a visit one. And just so we're clear about what that is, I'm going to say that that's seven days later. Uh, and then I'll do a visit to, and I'll say this is 90 days, just so you know you know what we're talking about. And then visit three, 
and I'll just say uh, 180 days. All right, so I've got four events, and if you notice at the top, there is a black box that has shown up. Don't forget to designate your instruments. So let me show you how this sort of manifests. If I look at my record status dashboard right now, I see there is a screening event, but I don't have a screening form. I got these three forms, which you know I don't even want for my screening event. So something is wacky here. So if I go back to my project setup and go down and click on the designate instruments for my events, this is going to be key because a, an instrument will not show up in an event unless you've associated it here. So to use that instrument over and over again in different uh, visits, you need to associate it. So I'm going to click on the begin editing and I'm going to say, well, I want my screening form on my screening visit. And I don't need the consent form right away. I'm going to do a consent form on day seven and I'll get an EKG. And then 90 days later, I want an EKG and a promise form. And on 180 days, I just want an EKG. Okay, and if I save that, and take a look at my record status dashboard now. You'll see everything is laid out for you nicely. Circlets available for you to click on to fill out these instruments. You can see what is supposed to be uh, entered for what event. So um, that's how you set up a longitudinal study. Um, Now, this is a drug study. So there is an option or an opportunity that I may have periods of shortness of breath, I may have some chest pain, I may have something, and I would like to get an EKG, but, and I would like to log it into my project, but, um, I don't have a place to put it if it's random. So thank goodness REDCap finally came out with what's called repeatable instruments. So in the past, if you wanted to collect uh, EKGs at random periods of time, you would build like 100 events just so you'd have places to put, capture those kinds of information. Now you don't have to do that. I'm going to go to my project setup. I'm going to scroll down and I'm going to add an event, a new event here. Basically what I want to do is create a bucket to hold random EKGs. So I'm just going to call my new event EKG. Okay, if I go back up and look at my uh, designate instruments for my events. I see that nothing is associated to the EKG. Well, that's not going to work, so I want to begin editing and immediately add the EKG form to that bucket event. Okay, and I'll save that. Now I'm going to go back to my project setup tab, and I'm going to turn on this feature underneath the optional modules. The very first one says repeatable instruments. I'm going to enable the repeatable instruments. Now you can do this for any of these instruments. I'm just going to go to the EKG. You can repeat a whole event or just an instrument. In this case, for this example, I'm just going to select an instrument an EKG form and save it so that I can show you what this looks like. All right, so I saved that. 
If I look at my record status dashboard, I see all my events, including my EKG form and my EKG bucket. So I've started my study, and three days after I started taking the drug, I'm feeling a little lightheaded. So I go in and get an EKG. Well, that's not part of my seven day or my 90 day or 180 day visit. This is outside of all that. So I come to my EKG form and I click on that and I say, I'm gonna get my EKG today. I upload my file, I get an interpretation and it just says normal sinus rhythm. And I'm going to say complete and save and exit my form. So look what we have now. Next to my EKG form, I have a completed EKG and I've got something new. I've got a little plus sign over here and if I scroll down a little bit, I can see a list of all my repeating instruments and see what's going on with my repeating instruments. So if I come in on day 14, which is also not part of my normal visit structure, I can click on the little plus sign if I'm in my record status dashboard. The same thing. I see the plus sign, I click on the plus sign. I put in the date and it's two weeks later and I upload the file and I see occasional BBCs. And I say complete and save and exit the form. Now we can see that there are these concentric circlets letting you know there's more than one. And if you look at your repeating instruments, you can see that there's multiples. Same thing if you're in the record status dashboard, you can see that there are circlets. So you know there's multiples. And if you click on one of those circlets, you can see that there are multiples. And I can add a new one here for day 45, let's say. Just pick a date here, and I'm going to upload my tracing, but I'm not sure about the interpretation, so I'm just gonna save and exit for now. If I look, I see my little circlets, they're blue now, which means if I look up at my legend, I've got many statuses, meaning I have some completed and some incomplete, and if I look at my EKG form down here, I can see that, um, there is an incomplete one. Also, there's a little tweak that you can do. Um, I kind of like when I'm at my project setup, when I do my, uh, uh, my repeatable instrument, if I come back in here, I can actually do a custom label. So I think my label for this was EKG uh, underscore date. That was the, I'm piping in the value that is being stored for that variable. And how that shows up is when I go to the record status dashboard and I open up that patient's record. Notice now I can see the dates that these were done. So these are, it's a nice reference. So you can do this with any uh, field and just um, attach them to that so you can see what those repeating instruments are. So that's repeatable instruments. Let's look at roles. Uh, I've got user rights. And I have an option here to create a role. So in this case, we're talking about, we're gonna talk about students. So I'm gonna create a student role. Okay, now I'm gonna assign what permissions a student should have. So they don't need any of this. They don't need any access to data. Uh, they can have some reports, stats and charts. It doesn't make any difference. Any of this stuff is irrelevant. All I need to do is make sure they can create records. I don't want them to delete records, for God's sakes. And 
make sure that they can view and edit and enter data into all my instruments. And then I'll create my role. So now I have a role sitting out here. So now I've got a new student and I'm going to, rather than add them with custom rights, I'm going to assign them to a role. So I'll enter somebody that, you know, I know that I want to associate to my project, a new student, and I'm going to assign them to a role. And now when I look below, they've been added and they have all the permissions of the role. So that's how you add a role. So you go to user rights and um, you create the role first, put and assign whatever permissions you want. And then once you have that role created, then you come in to add somebody and you can assign them to the role. If you do this after the fact, you can always click on somebody and assign them to a role right here. So I had somebody that uh, was very um, adept with REDCap and very organized. Um, and so they created an administrator role, a user rights role, a um, coordinator role, student role. There was like about seven roles. And so he got them all lined up with all the permissions that he wanted. And the first thing he did is he put himself in the administrator role. And then he went to put everybody else in the right role and he found he couldn't do he couldn't assign anybody to any other roles. It's because when he created the administrative role, he gave himself project design permissions and he didn't give himself user rights permissions. So as soon as he put himself into a role, he locked himself out of being able to make changes to anybody else. So he had to call or email me and ask if I would please take him out of that role so he could then uh, do it correctly. So be careful about uh, creating roles and putting yourself in roles, make sure that you have all the administrative permissions, otherwise you will lock yourself out. Even though you're the creator, once you put yourself, you remove yourself from the user rights role or that permission, you are no longer going to be able to assign people to anything. Okay, so since we're here, um, and, and we've done roles, uh, Let's look at um, let's go over to uh, let's go back into the events area and let's look at arms and data access group. So you can get at user rights also over here on the left. So I'm just going to go to user rights here. And, and I'm sorry, I'm going to get go to the events. So I need to go to project setup. And then I want to define my events. So I'm here and define my events. So notice here is where you can add ARMS if you want ARMS in your study. So uh, various um, types of ARMS would be like if you had uh, wanted to do um, compare two drugs. So you had one drug uh, and a second drug and you're collecting data. And when you create a new ARM, you assign whatever instruments you want. They aren't automatically assigned for you. You have to start with the whole process again of creating events for that arm and then assigning instruments for that arm. So if you had a, a, a control versus intervention group or a before and after kind of thing, you could set that up with different arms. The other thing um, that you can do with user rights is these data access groups, and it says right there, DAGs, data access groups. So these are sites. So if you wanted to have a study where you're collecting data from multiple sites, so for example, in my example, I will say I'm going to have a study that's 
um, collecting data from Northern Arizona University and Arizona State University. I'll just create a few groups here and then University of Arizona. So I've got these groups and then I have users. So you need to have created the user before you can put them into a site. So once I'm here, I can take my user and then assign them to a site and assign them. And now they will show up here. Now, in this case, Maria can only see data that has been entered for Northern Arizona University. We have one study going on, um, still going on, that has over 150 different sites. Um, I would hate to have to manage all that and all those users, but uh, it allows them to collect the data from all these different, lo different locations around the world and keep the data uh, walled off from people's prying eyes from different sites. You cannot be assigned to multiples. Also, make sure that you don't put yourself in a data access group. So let's say that this project is originating out of the U of A, and you're going to go ahead and put yourself in the U of A uh, site. As soon as you do that, you will no longer be able to see the data from NAU or ASU. So keep yourself outside the sites. Don't assign yourself to a site if you're the project manager. If you're entering data, you can enter data irregardless. It's just that as soon as you enter data, that participant that you've entered data in to REDCap is automatically associated to that site. That's how they get related, by who enters the data. Whoever is assigned to a site, when the data is entered, the site is, is associated to that participant. Yeah, yeah good question. All right, let's go. Yes. Yes. The group ID name was created when we created the. And there's group ID numbers, and they will all be different also. No. Well, yes and no. So the question is, when somebody who's not in a site, can they then, when they enter the data, um, assign that participant to a site, right? So let's just look at the data entry here. Um, I'm going to go to my record status dashboard. And uh, I've entered somebody in here. I'm going to open that record ID. And when I do, uh, if I look at like the screening form, for example, I can see up here that the data access group, there's nothing assigned. So if I go to that um, record homepage here, then I can um, assign them to a data access group here. And when I do, I can click and say, okay, they're NAU and then assign that record if I'm outside it. I can always do that as the project manager. If somebody uh, changes and we, it, it, like they move and you want them to be a part of ASU instead of, U, uh, of NAU or whatever, but this is how you uh, manage those uh, data access groups on a participant level basis as compared to your coordinator level basis. Good. Yes, I went to the record homepage and then used that choose action for record button here and then the little green sign data access group. No, I'm glad you're asking. Slow me down if, you, if I'm getting ahead. And when I do, then you have the ability of assigning them to a data access group or changing them. Yes. 
Exactly. This is important. So where do you get at the record homepage? Uh, when I'm in the record status dashboard, which is where I look at all my records. To get to the record status homepage, all you have to do is pick one of the ID numbers, and as soon as you do, it takes you to the record homepage for that particular person. Thanks for asking. Okay, so uh, that's that. So let's go to the, um, uh, we're going to go to our designer, right? I'm going to that, get at that up here in that link on the left to our designer, and I'm going to go to my screening form. I'm going to scroll down to the bottom, and I'm going to add a field here now, and this is going to be a text box, and I'm going to say wait. And in parentheses, I'll just say uh, in pounds, uh, just so you all are clear about what I'm doing. For a variable, I'll put weight. And normally, you might want to clarify this by using something we haven't used before called the field note. And if I type in pounds and save it, now you can see that I've got a label that tells me this is in pounds, but I have a little note underneath the field that tells me again this is supposed to be in pounds. And you can use these little notes um, for anything um, when you're uh, creating the field. So here I'm going to say height, and I'll say in inches, And a variable name for height. And for my field note, I'll say in inches. Oh, no, I'm just going to say inches. There we are. Save it. OK. So now I've got my weight and my height. I want to create a calculated field for a BMI. So to do that, I'm going to add a new field below that. And this field type will be a calculated field, third one down calculated field. OK. So I'm going to do a label, BMI. I'm going to do a variable name, BMI. And then I'm going to get into this calculation. So look at a few things. The first thing I want to show you is this link that says, how do I format the equation? This is incredibly helpful. I can't recommend this highly enough. If you look here, it will tell you all the different things that you need to know about creating a calculated field. Um, I use this all the time. So, uh, don't hesitate to reference this um, if you need to. Uh, it will tell you how to do um, ages, if you want to use date differences, um, all of that. So to start out with, the first thing that differentiates this from Excel, there is no equal sign. You also do not ever use capitals. So what I want to put here, the formula, is the weight divided by height squared to get started. So I'm going to put a left parentheses, and then I want to recall the value for the variable uh, weight. So left square bracket, and then put weight in those square brackets. That will return the value for the weight. Now, notice that red cap tries to be helpful here and tells you what variables you have available to you. And you can um, use that. Now, it would be nice if they would uh, show you that for every variable you wanted to enter. But this is the only one they do it for is that first one. 
So I've got weight, and now I want to divide it by, and I'm going to put a left parens and a left square bracket. I'm going to type in height and a right bracket, and then a multiplication sign, and a left square bracket, and height again for height squared, and then a right parens to kind of wall that off and get that height um, calculation in. So I'm going to enter the parentheses here, the final right parentheses, down here in this area in the bottom left underneath that window, watch what happens. I'm going to hit the right parens, and now I get a valid in green. Okay, that tells you that this equation, this calculation, will run. If you don't see that valid, it's not going to run correctly. So the rest of this formula is has a multiplication sign, and as soon as I enter that, you'll see this, there's an error in syntax, which of course there is because you're not going to leave it with a multiplication sign at the end. And then I'm going to enter 703, and as soon as I start entering, I get my valid back, which says, yeah, it's going to run. But of course, it doesn't mean that the formula is accurate. It just means that it will run. But if you don't see the valid, there's no use you, I mean, you can save it, and it will tell you that, you know, it's not going to run, and then you're going to have to figure out what you did wrong. Uh, so I'm going to save that. And I can view the equation by just um, clicking on it. And I can see this uh, at any time in design or in um, actual data entry to see what the equation that is that I'm using. And so if I go back to my record status dashboard and I open up my record and I scroll down and I say, OK, well, 180. And I'm 72 inches. As soon as I leave, bang, I've got a BMI. Now, you can change the how that output looks by adding rounding features in there. Um, just look at the equation itself and uh, in the calculated field in the help, and it will show you um, how to do that. Uh, No. Carrot squared, no. However, I have had people ask me for this incredible, complicated equation to put in there, and I mean, I've done it. But here's the thing with equations, they're calculated fields. How badly do you need to see the output of the calculated field in a data entry form? Or is it more important for it in analysis, where you would put it in your stats package or your Excel form or whatever. Um, so weigh the option. Now the BMI may drive uh, certain branching logic, so it's important to see it there. The other thing about uh, calculated fields um, is that you would think, let's say I, I have entered 10 records and at the end of the 10 records that I've entered, this is live data, and I realize that um, my equation is wrong. It should be 704. So I said, no problem. I go in and I change my equation to 704. And then I export my data, and I'm starting to look at my BMIs, and I'm looking, and they're like wrong. I'm like, oh, this is scary because does that mean like calculated fields don't work? And the the answer is yes, they work. And it's user error in this particular case, a web form in order to update 
a change in the calculated field, you need to open and save the particular instrument with the data in it for, to force that recalculation. What you put in before does not go away until you tell it to recalculate. Is there a way of doing that quickly? Yes. There is something on the left here called data quality. Okay, if you click on data quality, there is an option for H, incorrect values for, for calculated fields. If you execute this, you will be able to find if once you've made a change to calculated fields, if there are any errors, and then you can update, and all of them will update at once. So, it's 11 o'clock, we're out of time. Thank you all for uh, hanging in there with this class. And um, if you have any questions, please let me know at redcap at email.arizona.edu. And I'll go ahead and turn off the Zoom now. Thanks, uh, those of you that were attending on the Zoom. I appreciate it.